always felt that uh, uh, black folks, and, and then later the Cubans, got a more raw deal in Florida than anywhere else. Hmm. How about gays in Florida? Well, I don't expect they were uh, cherished. Hmm. But I think of Florida's God's waiting room, so maybe it'll all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arizona's a little bit. I mean, it's an interesting thing. You know, people from the East Coast and some Midwesterners go to Florida, but most Midwesterners go to Arizona. I would say that's <laughs> a wise decision. I grew up in Chicago, and you could sort of see the split. But I often think when I'm in Florida, my husband's mother lives the winters in North Miami, that it's really a, it's a New Jersey version of paradise. Oh, it's you know, if you look at the buildings, you can see Sinatra and the Rat Pack and all that. <laughs> I swear to you, I think it's just, you know, this is like, you know, the Bronx and, 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 and New Jersey, you know, kind of put together their idea of some wonderful. But if you can get away from all that and get into the yeah. Everglades or get into northern Florida, because most of them don't like right. northern Florida, you know, or the Panhandle, what we call Florabama, that's still pretty wonderful. It is nice. I love Tampa. I think that's a gorgeous area. And my uncle for years owned property on Amelia Island, which is just above Jacksonville. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like all that part, and it's it's quite different. But what took you back to Virginia? Because, I mean, I know you think of yourself as a Southerner. I've read things that, you know, where you talk about. Well, I mean, our, my father's family got there in, in 1620. In fact, they lived through the Good Friday Massacre of 1622. Mm. Um, and I loved it. And as a child, my mother would take me down in the summers, of course. It was a train ride down. And for whatever reason, I liked it a lot better than uh, where I was, or, or maybe it was just the romance of it, because I remember we went and sat on Dolly Madison's grave when I was a little girl, and so I felt like I met Dolly, you know, and my mother would take me to, and my mother didn't like history, but she realized that I did, and so she was a very, uh, she was very loving that way, and, and she would suspend her pleasures to make sure that I got mine, as long as I would go to the shed rows of Pimlico and Laurel with her, ah. and gather information on the horses, so we worked out a deal. So she would take me, and I saw Mount Vernon, and I saw, uh, uh, well, Miss, du Miss DuPont, uh, uh, she married Randolph Scott, but she was still living in uh, Dolly Madison's house when I was a child. Was that at, Ashlawn was, no, that was- That's Monroe. Um, that's Monroe, right? It's around the, the mountain from right. Monticello. Right. And none of these things were really prettied up yet. You mm -hmm. know, there was some restoration of uh, Monticello. I mean, that was further along, and also with uh, uh, Mount Vernon, but the others had, were sort of a little shabby, in fact, in some, case is very shabby. Right. And Poplar Forest was pretty much left to go to sea. Yeah, Ashlawn was the first time I saw it. It was just barely, you know, anybody was doing. Now I think they have an elaborate music festival oh, yeah. there and all kinds of stuff. Everything. But I remember it as pretty tacky. Well, but see, that's what I loved as a mm -hmm. child. I mean, it sort of stirred all these romantic notions of what it must have been, you know. Wonderful. And of course, it's around from, I've always thought the University of Virginia was really the, the great representation of Jefferson. I mean, I think the serpentine walls and the, you know, the, the quadrangle and the whole bit is just so wonderful. Well, he thought so. And on his yeah. tomb, president isn't there. It doesn't right. come first. I think it's, uh, there's three words. It's the Declaration of Independence, the Statute of Religious Liberty, and the founder of the mm. university, or the architect, whichever he said, at the University of Virginia were his three proudest achievements. And you're right, he never mentions being he president. Uh, and, I, and I love that. And that's also very Virginia. Very Virginia. Oh, it's a wonderful and, and romantic country. So when you were a kid, what was the pressure on you? To be Southern? You know, were you? No. Born? No, the pressure on me was to uh, say incredible instead of bullshit. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that didn't work out too well, did it? <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, were you brought up to because I mean, I, I, I spent 20 years in Virginia as always an outsider. You know, I'm from Chicago. My moment of truth was in 1958 when I graduated from New Trier High School. I had a choice between going to Smith College, which I rejected because it was still only women then, and I couldn't see there was a lot of point in that. I was 17 and full of hormones. I could have gone to Duke University, but they were having actual race riots. And when I went down to visit Duke, you know, on that invitation sort of thing, the women's campus at that time was still separate from the men's campus where the beautiful church was and the whole bit. And they were taking women students back and forth every day to class under armed guard on buses. And I thought, you know, I'm from Chicago. I don't think this is what I want to do. So I wound up um, at Stanford. And I always thought it was kind of a joke that years later, there I was back in Virginia in law for, for 20 years. Um, and I knew it was time to leave Virginia when in Asheville, uh, not Asheville, sorry, um, what is it just up the road from uh, from Bristol, the, the county seat there? I'm going blank. You mean in Abington? Abington, sorry, in Abington. There was a suit filed that was Scopes Revisited. 
It was a suit about whether or not you could teach um, Darwinian, you know, evolution in the school. And I had spent several years in a book discussion club with some really intelligent women who lived in that, in that part of the country. And at that moment, it didn't matter about, you know, all the years we'd spent discussing Leibniz, you know, Leibniz and Nietzsche and everything else. At that moment, everybody sort of lined up by whether they were Baptist <laughs> and, you know, and the whole bit. And once again, it was just like, it was just like going back to Duke, you know, in 1958. And I thought, I don't belong here, you know, I mean, because I really can't get into this lawsuit. It means it was so bizarre. So I came to Arizona, which is probably where I belong. But I can explain Virginia to you. Well, I'm sure you can, but the whole time I lived there, you know, <laughs> I sort of felt like I was under pressure to be a lady different than I am, you know, and to have family values that, that I have, but they weren't exactly the same at all. And so I sort of wonder, because you're obviously an unconventional person, you know, how was that for you? Um, well, let me first explain Virginia okay. as my mother would, and then I can tell you how it is for me. My mother, who was a Marylander, whose family also got there in the early 1600s, and you, there is this ferocious competition between Maryland and Virginia as to who's, who's the better state. Um, and poor old North Carolina, you know, because South, South Carolina also has a very high regard for itself. You know, here's North Carolina, sea of humility between these two mountains of conceit. I remember my mother at one point when uh, there, there had been some discussion with her mother-in-law, who she didn't like. She turned to me and she said, oh, honey, one out of every four Virginians is mentally ill. And she said, think of your three best friends. It's not them, it's you. And I always, that stuck with me. I thought, you're right, Mom, we're all nuts in a way. Um, for me, it's fine because the South cherishes its eccentrics. Yes, it does. As long as I have good manners, which I do. I mean, all those years, like Italian. Right. I mean, I do have them when I need them. Um, so I'm well-mannered. And so they, they kind of take a charge out of the other things I do because I'll say what they're thinking, but I'll do it in a funny way. Okay. And the fact that I'm in the middle of them, and of course since we've been there since the 1600s, it, it, it allows them to think they're more liberal and tolerant than they really are. There's a sort of an emphasis on gentility, I think. Maybe, you know, when you say good manners, don't you think of it as that sort of... I do. You know, I think gentility is a word you don't get to apply often, but if you're going to apply it, I think Eastern Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina, maybe are two places where it really factors in. Well, and it shows up in the, in the sneaky pies a lot, and also yeah. in the hunt books, because uh, there's an elaborate dance that you learn exactly. as a child. And you learn it as a child. It's so difficult. You truly learn it as a child the ways in which you deal with people and how they're, you know, it's like those Russian dolls where you keep taking right. the doll apart and you get, that's what Southern manners are like. You finally get down to the real thing. And uh, Northerners, I, and it, it's funny, Northerners are direct. They want the information, they want to know, time is precious. Exactly, yeah. I was always too fast for everybody. Yeah. I could see people visibly wanting to slow me down. Because what we want to do is dance. Right. It's the dance of community. It's the dance and of family the, too. Yeah. There's the, there's this incredible blended family thing, you know. And I mean, I love that in Whisper People. I particularly liked it because you have you know all these things going on with Big Mim and Little Mim, and you've got you know are Harry and Fair, you know, are they really going to you know kind of coalesce again? And it's like a big cotillion. It was sort of fun, you mm -hmm. know. But I was thinking about it. Is here's Rita May, you know, she's kind of riding these steps in this cotillion, and all of them were sort of forced into the into the dance. Well, and also the ways in which you you get revenge in the South are very elegant. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you, you might plot it out for a long time, but it's elegant. And there's no fingerprints. You have to, you learn to be a safe cracker. You leave no fingerprints. And, uh, it, but it does lend a certain um, ease to life. And the other thing about this, which I, I think people from uh, other parts of the country may not be aware, is this isn't about race. The dance of manners, it's everybody. You can be as poor as a church mouse. You can be illiterate. You can be African American, whatever it is, but everybody gets the manners. And if they don't, it's a terrible stain on the family. It really is. It's worse. It's worse than being gay. Aha. Okay. Well, that explains quite a few things to me. I, I appreciate that. The Whisper of Evil. You have done as your twelfth sneaky. Right. Thirteen. It's actually Mrs. Cook Murphy. Book. You know, it's easy to go wrong here and think that Sneaky Pie is the name of the cat no, in sorry. the book, but it's it's really Mrs. Murphy and the gang. But anyway, it's the I think it's sorry. Did you just say it's the twelfth? But there was a cookbook, so it's right. Really 13 and I was going to done. say it was twelve twelve novels plus the um, is it the Sneaky Pie yeah. cookbook for mystery lovers? Is yeah, that the title? That's it. You got which it. Which is which is really good fun. 